أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويقول الإنسان أإذا ما مت لسوف أخرج حيا أولا يذكر الإنسان أنا خلقناه من قبل ولم يك شيئا فوربك لنحشرنهم والشياطين ثم لنحضرنهم حول جهنم جثيا Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala ba'd. Where did we finish last time? Can you remind me? What did we do last time? Yeah, but what part of it? Because there's so many things that we need to do. Uh, because I wasn't able to finish. Did we talk about... Uh, the? So what did we... We finished that it's going to be only... Most likely only two times, right? We had mentioned that the name of the trumpet blower is Israfil, despite the fact that it is not mentioned in a authentic hadith linked with Israfil. But we have uh, other hadith about this. I also mentioned that our Prophet authentically told us that Israfil has lifted the trumpet and has taken his breath. That in one hadith in Musadraq of Al Hakim, our Prophet said that since Allah Azza wa Jal assigned him the job, Israfil has not blinked. Out of fear that if he blinks, the command will be given. And because of this, he said, Israfil's eyes are glazed like pearls, like diamonds. They're glazed. They are just completely now numbed over because he has never blinked since Allah assigned him this. So Israfil has been assigned. This is something that is very uh, uh, clear in this regard. So the next point that we will inshallah ta'ala do is the issue of whether the angels will die when the trumpet is blown or not. Whether the angels will die, whether the trumpet is blown or not, between the trumpets being blown. Now the popular opinion amongst most of the Muslim masses, and even most of our scholars who wrote about this issue, is that the angels will in fact die. And this is something that we hear all the time in popular culture. And in fact, one of our scholars by the name of Al-Manawi, who is a relatively recent late medieval scholar, he's only two, three hundred years ago. Al-Manawi wrote a commentary of Imam Al-Suyuti's book, Al-Jami' Al-Saghir, and it is one of the largest books of hadith, Al-Jami' Al-Saghir. And Al-Manawi wrote a commentary of that book, so can you imagine how large that is? So Al-Manawi, uh, in that commentary, he wrote that there is unanimous consensus that the angels will die along with all of the creation. But you see, this brings us to the very important point that not everybody who claims unanimous consensus is true. And one needs to do more research. But it is true to say a large group of people and also the Muslim masses, the, the popular culture, is that even the Malakul Mouth is going to die and Jibra'il is going to die, Israfil is going to die himself. What is their evidence for this? Of their evidences, first and foremost, of their evidences is number one, the generality of the Quranic verses that everything and everyone will die and perish. And there are a number of evidences. Who can give me some of these evidences from the Quran that everything will perish? Okay, okay this is one uh, evidence. And uh, also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullu shayin halikun illa wajhahu. This is Surah Qasas verse 88. Everything shall be destroyed except for the wajh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from these general verses, a number of our early scholars derive that yes, even the angels will perish. Of them is Qatada, the student of Ibn Abbas and Muqatil, one of the earliest Mufassirun ever. Muqatil died 150 Hijrah. This is very early. At Tabari died 310, so that's double the age. Tabari is much after if you look at this. At Muqatil died 150. He wrote a tafsir that is the earliest printed tafsir that we have of the Quran. And it's a very interesting one and it has its pros and cons. So Muqatil also said that this verse implies even the angels will die. Which one? And a number of other uh, uh, Mufassirin said the same thing. There's another uh, evidence as well. 
And this is an evidence that is found in a very long hadith uh, in the Musadraq of Al-Hakim, which is extremely weak, but there is a phrase in it that the malaika that are with Allah will die. There's a long hadith and there is this phrase in it. But this tradition is extremely weak, so there's no authority we can be given. And there is a third evidence that the angels will die as well. And this is the evidence that goes back to the hadith I mentioned last class, and I said that I would begin this class with this hadith. Remember that one? That I said in the last class that there is a very, very famous, Ibn Kathir says, it is a hadith ushtuhir. Yani everybody knows about it. Even though its isnad is something that is very, very uh, problematic. And uh, this uh, hadith has been absorbed in popular culture. And that's why I wanted to simply then reference it. And I said last class that I would translate the entire hadith. However, uh, this hadith is so long it is almost of this print that I have 20 pages long that it would not be feasible to translate. And even the fact that you have one hadith that is that long is very, very uh, problematic. And I need to just go into a brief uh, tangent over here. This hadith, uh, firstly, it is not found in any of the books that even students of knowledge or beginning students of knowledge will be familiar with. We have to understand hadith is a very complicated science and I can, I can understand why people are so confused about this issue of hadith and da'if hadith and people are just totally confused about this. And I have an undergraduate degree in hadith so I understand why it is so confusing. We need to understand hadith compilation was a human effort. Hadith compilation was a human effort. And we are familiar with the more famous and the more pristine and the more accurate books. And almost every Muslim is aware of the Qutb al-Sitta. And almost everybody hears the next level, Mustad Imam Ahmad, Mustadrak of Al-Hakim, Sunan al-Darimi, you've heard it even in my lectures. Very few people, even students of knowledge, go beyond 10, 11, 12 books. But in reality, there are hundreds, hundreds, no exaggeration, of books that were written in the first 400 years of Islam in which the authors attempted to compile a hadith and the majority of them are of mediocre effort or subpar effort, which is why people don't care about them unless they're very advanced scholars of hadith. The majority of them are done by people that weren't even a fraction like Imam al-Bukhari or like Imam Muslim or others and their names are not known. Also, the majority of them didn't really care to verify. They just want to collect. And to give you an example of what I'm talking about, imagine... Um, What's a good example? Like when I was growing up uh, in the 80s and 90s, um, there was something called the National Enquirer, tabloid magazine. But I guess most of you youth are unfamiliar with it. So I don't want to mention a bad blog or something. But imagine some um, blog that just compiles all rumors and scandals. Okay? Imagine something that is just no verification, just gossip. There must be some type of blog. I just... Don't know and neither do I want to mention to verify it or to want to, I don't want to popularize it. But you youth can understand that it's a gossip blog compared to the New York Times. Both are online. Both are one click away. But is there any similarity between the New York Times and its authenticity versus these blogs, right? So we need to understand many authors of that era are simply compiling what people are saying. They're not interested in verification. The New York Times has a prestige it needs to live up to. Okay? These publications, The Economist, for example, or any mainstream, reputable publication, it has established itself like Imam al-Bukhari did by a verification process. Whereas others, they're just doing it for popularity, for clicks. There were people who wanted to be popular and they just collected. And... There was a phenomenon that greatly contributed to the popularization of bizarre hadith. This phenomenon is kind of still around to this day, but to a different level. This phenomenon was known the phenomenon of storytellers, qassas, storytellers, okay? They would tell stories of an Islamic nature 
and they became more popular than the ulama and the preachers. Dare I say there's an element of this still very well known. Tabloid and refutations and stupidity generally brings more clicks than academic talks. This is the reality of things. This is the way human beings are. So there were storytellers. They would go around masjid to masjid and they would establish reputations. And they wouldn't care if it's authentic or not. Their goal is popularity because after they finished people would give them money and they would get fame and they would move on and on so this particular long narration is from one of it's the, one of the people in this chain is one of the most famous storytellers of medina of the 150 hijras this was the era of storyteller fame this was the era where people are becoming well known for narrating and this is a very very lengthy hadith quote unquote hadith it's very weak, but because number one, it is so detailed. Number two, and this is what Ibn Hajar Ibn Kathir says, many of its phrases are verifiable. I.e., the storyteller did a little bit of research and he compiled from the Quran and from authentic ahadith and then he kind of filled in the gaps if you like. Okay, so many phrases of this are verifiable. And because it is so vivid and graphic, this very long hadith became accepted in many books written in the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 10th centuries up until popular khutbas of our times. And I just wanted to mention certain things about this. So where is this quote-unquote hadith narrated? I'll give you some names. And again, even the students of knowledge that are just beginning would never have heard of these. Of them is Ibn Abi Dunya in his Kitab al-Ahwal. Of them is Ibn Abi Hatim in his Tafsir. Uh, uh, of them is Abu Ya'la in his Musnad. Al-Tabari uh, in his Tafsir has a shortened version of it. Al-Lalaka'i in Sharh Usul Atiqad and uh, Abu Sheikh in his Kitab Al-Azama, which is the one I'm going to be using. Al-Azama is a book that was written 369 Hijra, and the name of the author is Abu Sheikh Al-Asfahani. Most people have never heard of this, even students of knowledge are not aware. It is a five volume book uh, of uh, traditions about Kitab al Azama, the grandeur of Allah, the majesty of Allah, how majestic is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The whole book is about. A hadith that are meant to amaze you. Kitab al of Abu Sheikh. And he has in it, uh, Sifatu Israfil. The chapter regarding Israfil. And he has all of these interesting, bizarre, majority of them weak narrations. Okay? So, this hadith, I just wanted to quote you bits of it. We don't have time to translate. This hadith begins 800, uh, page 821. And it finishes in my edition in page 830. 838 so 821 to 838 this is the one hadith can you imagine i don't i wish i was there's no time to do all of this but it is i went through it today it's very very interesting i wish we could do it but anyway i just wanted to quote you the beginning of it so allegedly abu Huraira said that the prophet said that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after he finished creating the heavens and earth he created the creation he created the throne the the trumpet and he handed the trumpet to Is Israfil. And Israfil has forever remained staring at the throne of Allah, waiting until Allah will command him. Now, some of these phrases are authentic. We already quoted those hadith, right? Abu Huraira said, O Messenger of Allah, what is the trumpet? Masur. The Prophet said, Qarn, a horn that is blown into. Abu Huraira said, How is it? The Prophet ﷺ said, it is huge, massive. I swear by the one who controls my soul, that one circle of the trumpet, pause here. If you look up even the Jewish shofar trumpet, it goes in circles, right? It goes like this, right? So it's the, the, the horn goes like this, okay? So one circle or one circuit of this horn is as vast as between the heavens and the earth. Again, we, hear, we see the storytelling here. We see the exaggeration. This is not known from any hadith, but it's found here. If, imagine if you were a person in Baghdad in the second century and somebody's narrating this, you're going to be mesmerized, right? And this goes for 20 pages. You can go on here. Um, and Israfil will blow three times. Remember last, last class we mentioned? The evidence for three times, this is the most explicit evidence. Israfi will blow three times. Nafkhatul Faz'a, Nafkhatul Sa'iq, Nafkhatul Qiyam. 
this is where that evidence is coming from. Literally, it lists it. The first time when Israfil blows, everybody will be terrified. Like Allah says in the Quran, ما ينظرون إلا صيحة واحدة ما لها من فواق. And the second time, and and then the earth will tremble. Uh, and then he goes on and on. Uh, and then the Abu Huraira asked him about the dead people. The Prophet ﷺ said, the ones who are dead will not hear that trumpet, the first trumpet. And they will be in their graves at peace. And it goes on until, he says, Israfi will then be told to blow it for the third time. And this will be the, uh, no sorry, for the second time, Nafqa al-Sa'iq, the second time. And this will be the Nafqa, that all who are in the heavens and earth will fall down dead, except whom Allah pleases. Then the Malakul Maut will come to Allah, and He will say, O oh Allah, all the people of the heavens and earth have died, except whom you have allowed to live. Allah will say, Who is left? The Malakul Maut will say, You are left because you are the Hay who does not die. And the carriers of the throne are left. And Jibra'il is left, and Mikael is left, and I am left. Allah will say, O Jibreel and Mikael, die. So the Arsh will say, O Allah, you will cause Jibra'il and Mikael to die. And Allah will say, Be quiet, for I have written that all who are under the throne shall die. So Jibra'il and, and Mikael will die. Then the Malakul Maut will come. And he will say, Oh Allah, I have taken Jibra'il and Mikael. Allah will say, Who is left? He will say, You are left, O oh Allah, and the carriers of your throne, and I am left. You see where this is heading. Okay? One by one, everybody's gone until who's going to be left? Malakul Maut and Allah. Now pause here. How many of you have heard this in popular culture and khutab and durus? This is the evidence right here. Okay? As Ibn Kathir said, the hadith is well known. How many of you it has trickled down to such that it is the popular vernacular? Even last class, somebody raised his hand and said, Sheikh, but isn't this going to happen? I said, where'd you get it from? And he didn't know. I said, this is where you got it from. This is where you get it from. No one will be left until Malakul Maut and Allah. And then Allah Azza wa Jal will say to the Malakul Maut, Anta khalqun min khalqi. You are a creation that I have created. And so I am telling you to die. And so Malakul Maut will die. And then no one will be left except Al Wahid Al Ahad Al Samad. Laysa bi walidin wala walad. Kana akhiran kama kana awalan. And there will be no one left. And then Allah will say with His voice and a loud voice, Liman al Mulkul Yawm. And then finding no one to respond, Allah Azza wa Jal will answer himself, لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَّارِ And then the hadith goes on. And almost all of us have heard this portion of the hadith as well. Okay? Now, as we said, this hadith without a doubt is not authentic. No scholar has ever made it authentic. And from beginning to end, there are issues about it. But as Ibn Kathir said, there are phrases that are authentic in it. Now, the, therefore, in this hadith, there is an evidence that the angels will die. Correct? We just went over it. All the angels will die. These are the three evidences used that the angels will die. Number one, the generalities of the Quran. Number two, a very weak hadith. Number three, a very weak hadith. Is there any authentic evidence, therefore, that the angels will die? Clearly not. Has there been an alternative opinion? Yes, there has been an alternative opinion. And there have always been small groups of people that have challenged this. Of the earliest of them is a tabari in his tafsir who mentions in more than one place that the angels will not die. And of them is the famous Andalusian scholar, one of the most ingenious and eccentric minds to ever come from Andalus, Ibn Hazm. And I have said many times before that Andalus produced a very different caliber of ulama. The ulama of Andalus are very different than the mainstream world and the reason for this is obvious and that is because Andalus was a mixing of cultures. Andalus you had people of different backgrounds all coming together and so the minds that come from there are very very atypical. They're eccentric, they're genius, sometimes they're a little bit on the bizarre side and they also have amazing contributions that the Ummah did not get from the East, from Baghdad, from Damascus. And this is something very interesting. And I say, inshaAllah ta'ala, this also shows that sometimes being outside of the center 
actually brings about a lot of good as well. Sometimes being in a place and a land, and you get where I'm heading from this, where there's an intermixing of cultures, where science is at a different level, it'll make you think differently, and it'll make you realize things outside the box that you don't see when you're inside the box. And Andalus is the classic example of this. Ibn Hazm wrote in his famous book, Al-Fisal Fil Milali Wal Ahwa'i Wal Nihal, which is a five-volume book about all of the groups of Islam ever from the time of the Prophet up until his time. 400 years of Islamic history and theology. All of the different firaq, he has them there. And he mentions, and all of the different opinions, and he mentions about the death of the angels, what the people have said. And he says in that book, volume 4, page 21, there is no explicit evidence, nor is there ijma that the angels will die. If there was an evidence, I would have said this. But there's no dalil or burhan that causes us to believe that they will die. And that is actually against common... It doesn't make sense they will die. Ibn Hazm is saying. It doesn't make sense. Because Jannah is a place where there is no death. And the angels we know will be in Jannah. And they were created in Jannah. And they shall live in Jannah. The same he says for the Hurun'een. Why would the Hurun'een die? And Mot, he says, death is the separation of the body from the soul. Meaning the angels don't have a body and a soul. How will death happen? And our Prophet ﷺ explicitly said, the angels have been created from light. So what will be exiting what? When the angels are not body and soul. End quote of Ibn Hazm. So Ibn Hazm is saying, who said angels die? And notice another great scholar says, there's ijma that angels die. Just because a scholar said something doesn't mean anything and everything. The researcher, the academic needs to go deeper than this. And we have as well a very uh, uh, interesting point by an early scholar of tafsir, Al-Wahidi, who died in the 4th century of the Hijrah. Al-Wahidi, he uh, wrote a book uh, on tafsir and on Asbab al-Nuzul. And even though he didn't explicitly talk about the, the, the trumpet and the angels, he does mention the angels will live forever. And he derives this from a verse in the Quran. Very interesting. I found this very interesting. Al-Wahidi says that when Iblis came to Adam and tempted Adam to eat of the tree. What did Iblis say to Adam? The reason why Allah told you to not eat of this tree is that if you eat, you will become angels or you will become those who live forever. Al-Wahidi says, because angels live forever and do not die. Okay? So there's an interesting derivation that Adam knew. Adam knew that angels don't die. If the angels died, what would be the temptation to eat of the tree? I found this very interesting dalil that he's saying the angels do not um, die. And some ulama have also said that the angels do not die based upon the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, muttafaq alayh, Bukhari and Muslim, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the famous hadith, أعوذ بعزتك الذي لا إله إلا أنت الذي لا يموت والجن والإنس يموتون. I seek refuge in you and in your glory, O Allah. You are the one who is لا إله إلا أنت. You are the one who does not die, and the jinn and the ins die. Now, what is the evidence from this hadith? He did not say malaika. He did not say malaika. He said the jinn and the ins die. And this type of extraction, you should learn this, a uh, bit of an advanced usul al-fiqh, it is called mafhum al-mukhalafa. It is the derivation based upon the opposite implication. The fact that the angels are not mentioned. This is the mafhum, it's not the mantuq. He did not say the angels do not die. He was quiet and he could have, maybe even he should have if the angels are going to die. He said the ins and the jinn die. And he didn't say anything else. But you see, when you're going to mention this, you would typically say the ins and the jinn, the malaika. But he didn't. But mafhum and the evidences derived from mafhum are generally considered to be extremely tenuous and weak for many reasons. And he, he didn't mention the, the animals will die, even though we know they die. So mafhum is not a strong evidence in and of itself, but it is something that 
has been added to this list. Now, in the end of the day, not only is there no explicit evidence whether the angels will die or not, the fact of the matter, and I'm somebody to tell you this bluntly, there is no tangible benefit in knowing whether the angels die or not. It doesn't change our amal, nor did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us explicitly to believe in this or that. But you should know there is no evidence that the angels die at all. There is no authentic evidence. And frankly, I am sympathetic to Ibn Hazm that, that there is, I mean, the, the, the inhabitants of the Jannah between the two trumpets, it has nothing to do with them. They're a different world. The trumpet has to do with our world, not the world of Jannah and the people of Jannah. Will the Ghilman of Jannah die? Will the Hulun Ain die between the two trumpets? Not that it matters, but I mean, what, what, why would the wisdom be there? Now, somebody will say, but doesn't the Quran explicitly tell us, لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَارِ And we say, go back to the verse. Go back to the verse. Surah Ghafir, verses 15 to 17. Look it up. Allah says in the Quran, رَفِيعُ الدَّرَجَاتِ ذُو الْعَرْشِ يُلْقِ الرُّوحَ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ لِيُنْذِرِ يَوْمَ التَّلَاقِ that Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who raises the ranks, the one who owns the throne, the one who sends Jibreel to whomever he wants of his creation to warn them of the day of judgment, Yawm Talaqi, the day they will meet, one of the names of judgment day, Yawm Talaqi. Yawmahum barizun. On that day, they will be in front of everyone. لا يخفى على الله منهم شيء. Nothing will be hidden in front of Allah Azza wa Jal and them. لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَّارِ To whom does the kingdom belong today? To Allah the Wahid the Qahar. الْيَوْمَ تُجْزَى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ Today, everyone will get what they have earned and deserved. Now, today, 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 all of this, is this before the trumpet or after the trumpet? After the trumpet is blown, not between the two trumpets. Okay, so to be clear, the Quran does not indicate that Allah will say, "Liman al-mulkul yom." There will be dead silence. Then Allah will answer Himself because no one else responded. "Lillahi al-wahid al-qahar." Is that plausible to extract from the verse? Yes, it is plausible. And if you look up the classical tafsir, and uh, I looked up one of my favorite tafsirs and one that is highly underrated even though it is a beautiful book. It is Ibn al-Jawzi's book. Ibn al-Jawzi was a great scholar of uh, the 500 Hijra, 6th century of the Hijra, and he was a polymath. He wrote books in hadith and books in tafsir and books in fiqh and books in aqidah. And he has a nine-volume tafsir which is I personally benefit from it immensely and I find it to be one of the most useful tafsirs for me. It's something that is very original and it is called Zad al-Masir. And Ibn al-Jawzi in his Zad al-Masir, he says that this phrase, liman الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ Everybody says that this will be uttered after this world. But they have differed when upon two opinions. The first of them is that this will be said when, basically between the two trumpets, when no one will be able to respond, and so Allah will respond to Himself. لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ Allah will say, لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَّارِ And the second opinion is that this will happen on the day of judgment, meaning after the second trumpet. On the day of judgment, meaning after the uh, trumpet. And if you look up other books of tafsir, you find he is absolutely correct. Uh, for example, Ibn Abbas said, and this is all of tafsir of the Salaf, it's not a hadith. Ibn Abbas said, once all who are in the heavens and earth are, crea are, are destroyed, and only Allah is left, Allah will say, لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ and no one will be there to respond. So Allah will respond upon Himself. And Allah will say, لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَّارِ And that is an opinion. Therefore, according to Ibn Abbas, therefore, this is between the two trumpets. However, a number of other authorities, including Ata and Ibn Mas'ud, they said that this is going to happen after the second trumpet, meaning on the day of judgment. And Ibn Mas'ud said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gather all of the creation on the day of judgment. And 
the very first announcement to be made will be an announcer who says, not Allah. To whom does the kingdom belong today? Liman al mulku al yawm. And Ibn Mas'ud said, all of the creation will respond when the angel says, who does the kingdom belong to? And all of the creation will testify, Lillahi al-wahid al-qahar. He totally reverses the narrative, right? In Ibn Mas'ud's version, an angel asks, Liman al-mulku al yawm. To whom does the kingdom belong? And who responds? the entire creation responds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, bottom line, between the two trumpets, we do not know, and nor does it make a difference in our iman, who will still remain alive. Some have said that the entire creation will be destroyed, but there's no evidence for this. And some have said no, only this world and its inhabitants will be destroyed. As for the angels and the people of the heavens, there is no need to destroy them. And while there is no explicit evidence, they do have the default that that is the one that makes the more sense. And in any case, we conclude this section before we move on to the next one by saying, by saying what? It doesn't make much of a difference, but it is an interesting intellectual exercise, is it not? We go through and we see why people say what, and we get an understanding of why people say what they do. We'll only do another 10 minutes and then call it a day, inshallah ta'ala. The next section we're going to begin and continue next week is the issue of the hashr. The issue of the hashr. So we finish the trumpet now. The first issue on our list was the trumpet. The next is the hashr. And the hashar is clearly linked to and right after the trumpet. There is no controversy over the order of the trumpet and the hashar. Whenever the second or the third, depending on which opinion you follow, and by the way, there is even an opinion that says four, and I just left it out because how much do you want? I mean, this is an advanced class, but not that advanced. Some ulama even said four trumpets. I just let that go. Two or three is the one you should be knowing of. But some ulama said four. So the end trumpet, when it is done, what is going to happen after the end trumpet? The hashr. What is the hashr? The Arabic word hashara means, and it's such a deep verb, such a deep verb, and only the Arabic language, the verbs are so deep. It means, listen to this, to intentionally gather, so it's not accidental, people or entities who have been separated, so they're not already there, for a higher purpose, three things. The word hashara implies three things. Number one, that the gathering is done by a third party. It's done intentionally. Doesn't just happen randomly. Number two, that the people that are gathered were not there in the beginning. They are gathered. That is the whole hashar. And number three, they're not just gathered for no reason. They're gathered for a goal for a purpose so for example and the quran has this meaning for non judgment day verses for example in surah an naml sulaiman calls all of his army and entourage of animals and jinn and beasts and our uh, soldiers to parade a war parade and what word is used wa hushira this is Hashr. He's the one calling them. They weren't together. And there's a purpose. This is a war parade now, right? So this is Hashr. Allah uses in this for, for this meaning. And in the story of Fir'aun, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions uh, that Fir'aun wanted to execute Musa or do a debate with him and whatnot, so the... Uh, the entourage or the viziers of Fir'aun said, why don't we do it on the day of our celebration? Let's have this debate when there's a Eid going on. Okay? Let us have our debate on the day of our celebration. On this day, everyone will be gathered. Yuhshar. Right? This is Hashar. They have been gathered by the Fir'aun. There's a gathering going on. Everybody's going to be there and there's going to be a higher purpose of celebration. This is what Hashr is. So Allah calls the first act of the Day of Judgment Hashr. And 
Over 35 times in the Quran, Allah references the Hashr. 35 around, not exact, around 35 times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the Hashr, and especially in the context of, for example, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ Know that you will be gathered in front of him or by him and to him. So there are many verses in the Quran and of them as well is one that links the hashr with the trumpet immediately. And this is important because, and also, also logical, what's the first thing that's going to happen when the trumpet is going to be blown? Everybody's going to come and gather. That's the hashr. So in Surah Taha verse 102, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ يُنْفَخُ فِي الصُّورِ وَنَحْشُرُ يَوْمَ يُنْفَخُ وَنَحْشُرُ Immediate. The day that the trumpet will be blown and we will then gather the mujrimin. We're going to gather them on that day. So the hashr will come right after nufikha fi sur And that's something that is logical and, uh, and uh, common. Like what else is it going to be other than the hashr? And the hashr will begin with a gentle and persistent rain. The hashr will begin with rain falling. Not a torrential rain but a gentle rain that is going to rain for Allah knows how long. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith in Sahih Muslim, ثُمَّ يُرْسِلُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى مَطَرًا كَأَنَّهُ طِلُّ أَوِ الظِّلْ فَتَنْبُتُ مِنْهُ أَجْسَادُ النَّاسِ Then Allah will send down rain as if it is a cloud or a, you know, a til is like a, 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 a mound, not a mountain. It's like a good quantity, but in a gentle way. Allah will send water down. And from this water, the bodies will grow back and become full again. So, water was used to create us. Allah says in the Quran, خَلَقَ كُلَّ دَابَةٍ مِّمَّا Water was used in the initial creation. And it will then be used in the second creation as well. Allah will send water to the earth. And from that water that comes in one hadith, which is slightly weak, it says the water will come from under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a water that is of a divine source will come and it will then cause mankind to grow out back as they were. It will cause mankind to come forth from their graves. So the bodies will be recreated with that water coming down and the sand that they were in or the soil that they were in, just like we were first created from the combination of water and soil, water and sand, right? Allah says in the Quran that we created man from water and we created man from teen, from teen, from teen il lazib. And teen il lazib is mud. And Allah says we created man from turab. Turab is dry sand, right? So Allah says we created man from water. We created man from dry. Then what is water and dry sand together? Teen il lazib. Muddy water, right? This is muddy stuff. And then after this, salsalin kal fakhar. Salsal is hardened clay. When you take that mud and you harden it, that is salsala. That is salsala, to reverberate. Salsala is literally, that sound is salsala. So anyway, that's a different thing. So the point is that Allah is saying He sends the water down and the water will then cause the bodies to come. And this bodies coming out of the graves is explicitly referenced in the Quran multiple times. Multiple times. Perhaps the most explicit one is by using the phrase ba'thara. Ba'thara, which is mentioned at least three or four times in the Quran. أَفَلَا يَعْلَمُ إِذَا بُعْثِرَ مَا فِي الْقُبُورِ وَإِذَا الْقُبُورُ بُعْثِرَتْ And ba'thara means the earth is turning over and shaking. The earth is going helter-skelter. So when the person is going to come out, what's going to happen to the earth? The earth that is around him. That's ba'thara. إِذَا الْقُبُورُ when the qabr will, the, the, the earth that has solidified, it will just go around everywhere. And therefore, what, why will that happen? Because the body is coming out. 
Okay, so the body will come out, and Allah mentions وَإِذَا الْقُبُورُ بُعْثِرَتْ أَفَلَا يَعْلَمُ إِذَا بُعْثِرَ مَا فِي الْقُبُورِ And of course, the body coming out of the grave and coming out from the earth and the sand, this is exactly what Allah says in the Quran, which is the famous verse that is the culture of our religion to say when somebody is buried, مِنْهَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ وَفِيهَا نُعِيدُكُمْ وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَى From this you were created, from sand and clay and water. And we are going to return you to this, and then we shall cause you to come out one more time from this same creation. And so this shows us that the bodies will be recreated. Obviously, our actual physical bodies will become dust. They're going to perish. Then Allah will recreate the bodies. Like we created you in the beginning, we shall recreate you again. There shall be a second recreation. And that is why Allah says in the Quran, And He created the creation once in the beginning. And then He shall... Do it all over again. And it will be even easier for him. This is the doing it the second time. This is the recreation. That every one of us will be recreated afresh. But we will be in our shakil, our forms. But it will be a second creation. And Allah says, like we did it once, we're going to do it again. And as the people come out of their graves, we learn that they will come out in different manners. One thing will be the same in all of them. And that is that when they come out of their graves, they will come out, as our Prophet ﷺ said, hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, تُحْشَرُونَ حُفَاتًا عُرَاتًا غُرْلًا You will be resurrected. حُفَاتًا حُفَات means not wearing any shoes. حُفَات means barefoot. عُرَات عَارِي Naked. Naked, without any clothes. Ghurla. Ghurla is a word that there is no actual equivalent in English, but the closest is uncircumcised. I.e., before you circumcise the child, it is ghurl. It is uncircumcised. Or before you circumcise the animal, or whatever, it is ghurl. So circumcision changes the status of ghurl. And ghurla is basically, you are not going to be circumcised. I.e., the way that you were originally and that's what Allah says, كَمَا بَدَأْنَا أَوَّلَ خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُهُ The way that you were first created, but you won't be a baby. You're going to be a full person. And when he said this, Aisha said, Ya Rasulullah, the men and the women will be naked? Won't they be staring at one another? Won't they be staring at one another? And the Prophet ﷺ said, O oh, daughter of a Siddiq, he would call his wife this lovingly, a bint al-Siddiq, or daughter of al-Siddiq. The matter is much more terrifying than that. The matter is much more terrifying than that. Meaning, you know, when there's a tsunami wave coming, you're not worried about these things. When the genuine terror strikes, may Allah protect us, an earthquake is happening, you are not concerned about anybody else. It's just nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. Right? Oh Aisha, the matter is much more terrifying than people are going to be caring about anybody else. Nobody cares what anybody else will be look like. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us in an uh, authentic hadith uh, that uh, the first uh, person to be clo- the first person to be resurrected is me. I will be the first person to come out of the grave. So out of all of the creation. Our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be the first to stand up. And he said in another hadith that the first person to be clothed is Ibrahim alayhi wa Very good. Is Ibrahim alayhi wa And we'll talk about this inshallah ta'ala uh, next week about some of the wisdoms over here. Now, uh, before I conclude, so the general rule is that everybody will be resurrected Barefoot, naked, and uncircumcised. Now, there is a slight potential problem in that our Prophet ﷺ authentically said a number of times to a number of scenarios that, for example, the shaheed, 
that bury him in his clothes. Keep those clothes on because he shall be resurrected and the blood will be smelling like musk and the wounds will be this and that. And he said to the one in Ihram who died, there's a famous incident uh, that has a lot of fiqh in it that when the Prophet was going for Hajj, uh, one of the Hujjaj, his, his, his camel went back and he fell down and the camel is like 10 feet high. He fell on his head and died. So the Prophet said, this is the fiqh of when you die in Ihram, bury him, does anybody know? In his Ihram. Bury him in his Ihram. And that means his head is not going to be covered. Because he's in the state of ihram For he will be resurrected In that state Pronouncing the talbiyah Labbaik Allahumma labbaik His ihram will still be there Now Why is this problematic? How is this problematic? Because the first hadith says what? That everybody shall be resurrected Naked And then we have a number of a hadith that say These clothes will be Will be There on judgment day Okay How do we reconcile? Okay, one in opinion is exception. But the problem with this comes, our Prophet said, the first person to be given clothes is going to be Ibrahim. If anybody had an exception, it would be the prophets. Okay, so anybody else have a guess here? Resurrected earlier? Yes. So this is uninterpretation. Mashallah, brother has uninterpretation that the shuhada are alive. But of course, and some have said this, but of course this is problematic in the sense that will not the shuhada be resurrected on judgment day and come on judgment day and be judged? Even if their judgment is easy, even if they're going to free pass, won't they come physically on judgment day? They will. So some have said this, but it doesn't quite solve the issue. I'll just give you the response that seems to be the most obvious one to me and to other ulama as well. And that is that they will all be resurrected naked, but the clothes that they will be given will be these clothes of the dunya. And in this dunya, they might have been cheap or whatnot, but in the akhirah, it will be a badge of honor. In the akhirah, the fact that 99.9999% are naked and only the mu'minun, as we're going to discover, will be given clothes, right? And now imagine if you see somebody in ihram on the day of judgment, obviously that's going to be a sign of honor. Like Allah is honoring him that on this day you're wearing ihram, right? So they will be resurrected naked, but the clothes they're going to be given will be the clothes that they died in and they are instructed. So the martyr and the, and the uh, muhrim. Okay? These are the two, and the main ones that, that the Prophet told us. They should be buried in their clothes. Let them, they, because they will be, become badges of honor on the day of judgment. So this is an interpretation that brings both of these are hadith together and Allah Azza wa knows best. We have to continue this but time is up. So inshallah ta'ala we will stop here and open the floor for some Q&A and then inshallah continue next Wednesday with the ta'ala. Any quick questions about today's lecture? Bismillah, yes. We're getting there. That's going to be next week inshallah. Yes, brother is good. Okay, so uh, Brother Javid asks that those who say the angels will not die, how do they reconcile with the fact that only Allah is al hay and al awwal and al akhir and yabqa? No one else is al baqi, yabqa. Whether Allah's name is al baqi or not is another controversy. So the response to this is that. How do you respond to the fact that once we are resurrected, we will never, ever, ever, ever perish? However you respond to that is the exact same response that can be given to the angels. Because the angels were created at some point in time. And they are then going to live forever. 
we too, the Muslim and the Kafir, after our resurrection, will have that same eternal life. Right? That eternal life is one direction, unidirectional. It is not, I'll teach you some two English words, sempiternal and post-eternal. Okay? These are fancy fancy terms. Pre-eternity and sempiternity if you like. Eternity before, eternity after. So Allah Azza wa Jal is pre and semp, both. Allah Azza wa Jal is awwal and akhir. No other creation is both. Right? All creation has a beginning. No one is al awwal. Right? And therefore, since no one is al awwal, there can be no al akhir when there was no al awwal except Allah. We are not al akhir because we didn't have al awwal. We were created. So the answer to that is as I have said. Sisters, any questions before we conclude, inshaAllah ta'ala? Yes, sister, you are very that you'll have to speak loudly. Bismillah. Uh, so sister, were you here when we talked about the barzakh? I, the first lecture of the barzakh or the second one I talked about the soul. And I mentioned it is a common misunderstanding that the soul is a part of Allah. And I said this is not Islam. When Allah says, وَنَفَخَ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِهِ Allah breathed the ruh into Adam, his ruh. His ruh here is not the ruh of Allah. It is a creation that Allah has called the ruh. And Allah has said, this creation is mine. Not that it is Allah's ruh. Allah does not have a ruh. Allah is not like us. So this notion of a part of divinity being inside of us, this is not a notion that is a part of Islam. In fact, this is something that is known as Gnosticism, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S-M, Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is an ancient philosophical uh, trend that has many manifestations. And uh, you can look that up, but it is not Islam. The ruh that Allah blew into Adam is a created ruh. It is not a ruh that is divine from Allah. Is that clear? Okay, inshallah it is getting late, so inshallah we'll stop here. We'll continue inshallah next Wednesday. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. لا يزال الخير حيا لا يزال إن في الدنيا سلاما وظلال أخبر الأيام أنها في وصال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال